All right, this is lecture two from lesson one. Let's get started. So I want to talk now about the changing nature of place. Uh, I've talked quite a bit about, you know, an XY location on Earth, a single place name being kind of the, one of the main aspects about the geospatial revolution, right? Being able to know where something is. Well, that kind of simple geotagging alone isn't really enough. The places that actually matter to us quite a lot uh, are actually more difficult to describe, right? Just as an example, I live in a place called Happy Valley, which is just a colloquial name for the place that we live, uh, the relative region around Penn State. And I live in a neighborhood called Hunter's Chase, because we love our uh, sort of Victorian era English imagery when we design these place names. And both of those places are imprecise, right? They're not uh, basically easy to delineate on a map. You might be able to draw a boundary around the neighborhood in one case, but even what that gets called among uh, social circles, among, among my friends, for example, uh, may be totally different things, right? And it's certainly not one point on the Earth. So a really big ongoing challenge in the geospatial revolution is in how we handle these types of locations. It's not just one little spot on the Earth, right? That's really important, too, but it's also these con concepts of place that are very difficult to deal with. Here's an example. Uh, using the wonderful resource of Twitter, let's look at what people were talking about when, they, when they're discussing uh, place in relation to delicious cinnamon rolls from Cinnabon. So the first tweet here by this person named Ella talks about how Cinnabon can be delivered in the UK. So where is the UK? Well, that is a known thing, of course, and it's got boundaries and things like that, but it's certainly not one point on the Earth, right? It's a bunch of collection of points. It's a region. It's a place. It also invokes concepts and thoughts about that, that set of uh, islands and stuff, right? You, you immediately conjure a thought of Great Britain and the other associated territories, and so the UK is not just one little point on the Earth. We've got Lady Hanna here talking about um, somebody getting them uh, Cinnabon whenever they go to Los Angeles. They say LA. We know that that means Los Angeles. But if you t try to teach a computer how to automatically make a map out of this kind of stuff, that gets tricky right away. Does LA always mean Los Angeles? It does most of the time, but not all the time, right? And the one that I'm really excited about here is Ella talking about getting Cinnabon at Chicago Airport. And there's a bunch of airports in Chicago, right? Not just one. So which one is it? when transferring to and from Austin. So it implies a journey from a couple pla one place to another, and there are multiple places relevant here, and none of them are really explained by points on the Earth, are they? They're kind of uh, you know, regional concepts or transit nodes in this case. So geography is a lot more than just one little spot in the Earth. That's really the point I'm trying to make here. Even with cinnamon rolls, uh, the way people talk about geography in relation to that gets pretty complicated pretty fast. Here's a, a lot more uh, sensible kind of example, I guess. This is uh, by the great folks at bostonography.com, a collection of cartographers who are doing some really cool community mapping work in the Boston area. And this is a map of the results of a community survey to try to identify where the most popular neighborhoods in the city really are. What are their boundaries? And so the darker areas indicate high levels of agreement about certain areas, and the lighter areas indicate lower levels of agreement about certain areas. And if we zoom in another step and look at one of these neighborhoods, you can see how this plays out. This is their respondents, a bunch of people that participated in the survey of neighborhoods. Uh, the dark blue area shows where more than 75% of people agree that this area is actually Fenway, Kenmore. Uh, the lighter blue areas and bluish green areas indicate where there was less agreement, but some people responded that that was part of those neighborhoods. And this is what I mean by the changing nature of place. This concept of place is something we're really trying to wrap our heads around. We want to be able to map this stuff, but you can see it's really problematic. Certainly not easy. So I want to step back a minute and talk about geography, because I've been making assumptions about it, right? So what is geography? Well, geography is the science of place and space. That's the official definition according to the Association of American Geographers. And common responses to the I'm a geographer uh, thing that I say when I fly somewhere include four major things, and I just want to stop you from doing these in the future. That way you have a better answer than these. So the first answer I typically get is, oh cool, I have a cousin who's a geologist. Well, geology is a totally different science uh, focused on the physical uh, surface and under, under surface of the earth, and it's not geography. So I don't study rocks. The second response I get quite a bit to, I'm a geographer, is haven't all of the maps already been made? So, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I guess I'm an idiot for going and getting a PhD in this. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do now. I guess I'll have to quit my job. The third response, uh, which is a lot less depressing, is, oh, neat, I don't know what that is. And that's a pretty common one. I don't mind this one as much. So this is where I want to be able to say, well, we, you know, all the mapping stuff you use every single day is influenced by the science of geography. 
Uh, the fact that your phone knows where you are didn't come from nothing. Uh, there was a whole bunch of people working on these kinds of problems for ages, including how they're represented on maps, how the technology comes together with the science, etc. So I like that, that uh, question a lot. At least admitting you don't know, that's fine. And then the fourth response, which is kind of one you can't really react to, is, wow, that is so sad that you're a geographer. And some people just basically take delight in being a crappy person. So can't worry about that one too much. But now you know. And when I talk about geography, I'm often talking about geospatial things too, right? It's even in the title of the class, right? Geospatial revolution. So what's the difference between geography and geospatial? Well, geography is the science of understanding the place in space, as I just mentioned. It's, it's the underpinning discipline that's happening here. It's the practice of understanding uh, place in space. Geospatial is more of a modifying term. It refers to the types of data and technologies that allow us to explore geography and geographic problems. So I'll often talk about geospatial data or geospatial technology. And that just is basically modifying data and technology to signify that we're talking about the spatial context of those things. So geospatial is more of a modifier. Ge geography is the underpinning science. Hopefully that's uh, sensible for you. So there are two major kinds of maps that I think are relevant to this, uh, to this course and uh, are the most common ones that we deal with in cartography. There's thematic maps and there are reference maps. And you're probably thinking, aren't there just maps? Well, um, let me walk you through these two major types. Thematic maps are used to showcase geographic data observations. They're almost always associated with some kind of storytelling. You're trying to convince somebody of a point of view or help them understand some data through the use of that thematic map. A reference map, which is also sometimes called a base map in the cartography literature, provides the basic geographic context required to situate other things. It's sort of the canvas on which other things can take place. And they're typically used for navigation, for example. So let's look at some examples of these things. Here is a choropleth, so a color-filled area map, uh, by county, lower 48 United States, of the percentage of households that are headed by females. So this is an important census demographic if you're looking at family composition in the United States and you want to understand the geography of that kind of thing. And if you look here, you see in the uh, southeast corner of this map, the southeast states have quite a lot of counties that are in the highest category here, the darkest green areas. These are the places that have some of the largest uh, proportion of female head of households. And the central plain states, that's where some of the lowest proportion of female head of households are. So this is an example of telling a story with data, and this is a great example of a thematic map, right? Now you know what that is. In contrast, a reference map, or a base map, is really the context around which another story can take place. So here is an example of one of my favorite places in the world. This is Tokyo. Uh, and this is relatively zoomed out, right? So this shows major roads, some of the physical features, place names, and st stuff like that. It's designed to provide the context of a place, but it doesn't really have a story that it's trying to tell, does it? Here's another example that uses aerial photos and satellite imagery, along with some ocean data and things like that, but the same general concept, right? It's just supposed to give you a sense of those places, their relative position from one, one another, and maybe some basic attributes like the landscape, topography, and th those kinds of things. And then here's a reference map that I think is quite a cool one. This is designed to be used as an underlayment for which you can put other pins and uh, drop your favorite restaurants on top of it and things like that. It's designed from the ground up to be a very plain, uh, simple canvas that provides the most essential information but doesn't overwhelm the map with other stuff so that it provides the basis for putting things on top of it. So this is a good example of a great simple base map design. These are all reference maps and I think uh, hopefully this makes all kinds of sense to you now. <laughs> So making maps requires us to react to the fact that the Earth is round and maps are flat. We need two things to, uh, to happen from this. We, first, we have to have a reference system to locate things in the Earth. So what do we do? We impose a grid on the planet with lines of longitude and latitude to measure our distance uh, east and west and north and south. We can give ourselves that point location I've talked about a few times. Now transforming those locations from the 3D Earth to a 2D map requires something called a projection. Projections use some very fancy math to lift the stuff off of the 3D sphere onto a 2D plane. So projections can preserve area, shape, distance, and other attributes, but they can't preserve everything at once. And to show you an example of why this is problematic and sort of why projections exist, let's consider an orange. So if you were to try to peel an orange off, uh, uh, take the orange peel off of an orange, having drawn the world on it, so you have a little pseudo-globe and you try to unpeel it, this is probably what you would get 
if you were really, really good at doing this task. You would end up with what amounts to an interrupted projection. Um, so you have to make cuts in this surface in order to make it spread out and flatten it out. You can see in this case it works okay and you can actually flatten out the earth and you end up with a reasonable uh, type of map. If you try to do this at home, you're probably going to make a huge mess and you're going to find out right away just how hard it is to transform something from 3D to 2D. And this general principle is kind of helps explain why projections are important and why they're problematic. Every time you take something off of that 3D sphere, put it onto a 2D map, you have to make some compromises about how things look and how they, how they relate to each other in terms of math.